So can you explain perhaps a little bit about the route from your previous work to these particular lectures? Well, I have to admit that some of the themes of the lectures will be drawn from previous work. Um, and uh, in particular, I've already written uh, quite a lot about the rationale for what I was earlier calling special damages. So that's quite a well-formed position in my mind, and I hope on paper as well. And the, the way I want to develop that in the lectures is I want to think a little bit more about how this topic, the topic of repair, relates to what some people think of as reconciliation, and in particular the reconciliatory force of apology and symbolic acts of reparation, like delivering a bunch of flowers. So th there you can see one playing out of the relationship between uh, private law and personal life. So that's a, that, I think, will f form one of the lectures. There's also, um, in, in my work in the past, um, a, a concern with the way in which the uh, results of our actions um, can be morally significant. That's part of the widely discussed topic, moral luck. And uh, this agitates lawyers for obvious reasons. Many parts of the law uh, land us with liability that's in part sensitive to the results of our actions, and none more so than private law, where the results of our actions provide the measure uh, for damages awards. And so I'm going to revisit some of the problems about uh, how the results of our actions could be morally significant to us by taking on a, a, an interesting riposte to that view that I associate with Arthur Ripstein, uh, who uh, wrote a an interesting article about biography and the way in which a biography differs from a liability, a series of liability judgments. And so I want to cast doubt on whether the difference is as stark as Arthur thought. So you can see again mm -hmm. the continuity of personal life and private law being brought out there. And then finally, I, I want to talk um, about something that I haven't developed so much in my existing work, um, which is about the hankering that we have to hold on to the lives we already have rather than embarking on better ones should they become available to us. So for private lawyers this comes up a lot because people ask, well why not give these people the money they should have had, not the money they would have had, when those are two quite different measures. Sometimes people are too rich, footballers and pianists maybe, and they should be given less. Sometimes they're too poor and they should be given more. Why not use the opportunity of tort law to ignore the way things were going for them and to press the reset button? And I want to connect that more generally with the question that arises in personal life about holding on and letting go, mm. about why we should want to hold on to lives we have even when we can see that our lives might have gone better by going another route. And you can see lots of pragmatic reasons why you might want to hold on. The transaction costs might be high, but personally, I think it goes a bit deeper than that. So that's the third theme that I'm planning to explore in my lectures. So there I've given away three themes that I'm going to explore in the lectures. I'm going to explore the relevance of results to our personal narratives, as well as to private law. I'm going to explore the relevance of repair and reconciliation in our personal lives and in private law. And I'm going to explore the relevance of holding on and letting go in personal life and in private law. That third theme resonates a little bit with the ideas of integrity that have been very prominent in moral philosophy and in legal philosophy. Does that notion figure in your development of that third theme? Well, I'm not expecting it to, um, but you never know, because that's the bit I haven't really worked out yet. Right. Uh, I tend to think that um, integrity is concerned with the maintenance of the person rather than with the continuity of the life. And while those two things are clearly connected, I don't think they're identical. So I want to try and understand how somebody, even though they went through very great changes as a person, might want to hold on to their lives. And that might be hard to do. It might not be a going concern anymore. Um, but you might say that the reason you want to change as a person is precisely so that you can hold on to a life that you've already built. And that does show the space for those two problems to come apart. And so it shows the possible space for the problem of integrity to come apart from the problem of keeping your life going and not letting go. Can you say something a bit more about the structure of the three lectures and, and perhaps also their very interesting titles? 
Yes, so uh, let's hope I can now <laughs> remember the, the three titles. So in fact, I already hinted at one. The middle lecture is going to be called Say It With Flowers. That's right. Uh, because I'm going to try and explore the relevance, if any, of uh, symbolic or social meaning to the devices we have for repair and reconciliation. And I'm going to carve up these devices uh, according to the relevance of meaning in the uh, in our resort to them. So sometimes we should say it with flowers, but sometimes we should not really be saying, we should be just paying back. It's not a matter of what we say when we pay back. That's that's the um, the, the middle lecture. Um, the, uh, the final lecture is uh, called um, uh, The Way Things Used to Be. And that's a uh, reflection on our hankering to hold on and uh, the feeling that people have, which I think is not just psychologically but rationally explicable, that, um, uh, that there's something to be treasured in keeping things the way they used to be. Um, although that's not all there is to be treasured and if we did that all the time we would uh, really find it very hard to find any value in life. So we do have to launch ourselves out from the way things used to be from time to time, and private lawyers need to understand the relationship between those two pressures, if you like, the, the pressure to hold on and the pressure to let go or launch forward. So that's the, the way things used to be. And then the, the first lecture is uh, has a sort of umbrella name. Uh, it's going to be um, called That's the Story of My Life. And um, that's when I'm going to try and explore yet again, uh, I hope, not in a boringly repetitive way, the question of um, what makes up the uh, uh, the personal biography uh, and how the inputs, as they're sometimes called, are related to the outputs, how our efforts and endeavors and uh, projects and goals are supposed to be factored in there alongside the achievements, disappointments, and other traces we leave behind on the world. And that, that's tricky. Um, there are lots of uh, interesting reflections on this in literature, and I'm going to try and bring some of those in. But most of all, I'm going to try and answer Arthur Ripstein. Right. Let me take up just a little bit that notion of value in the way things used to be. Mm. I mean, it sounds very intriguing, but someone might say terribly conservative notion that merely because things were a certain way, there's value in continuing. Mm. Shouldn't there be limits on that? Well, I certainly think there should be limits, and I, part of the reason for drawing attention to the importance of the way things used to be is precisely to throw up the limits. Uh, if, you, if you're too wedded to this idea, then you do become a conservative, and I really don't want to become that. But I do want to recognize and show the rational appeal of a conservative feature of private law, which is also present in ordinary life. And I think it's present in progressive thought as well. So here, for example, uh, is a place where it comes up in those debates in the 1960s about um, the enforcement of morals. Um, so uh, Patrick Devlin, Lord Devlin, made the suggestion that the law should enforce moral principles without further ado, subject to kind of considerations, but it should think of moral principles as up for enforcement. And Hart replied, invoking, H.L.A. Hart replied, invoking John Stuart Mill's famous harm principle. And uh, in the harm principle, he uh, advocated that the law should intervene only when and to the extent that it's necessary to prevent harm. Now, immediately you think about that, you think, well, what, what counts as harm? It has a retrospective or conservative feature to it already. You know, thinking about people having things taken away from them, their progress in life as it would have been being somehow diverted. Uh, it's not just the same as failing, harming somebody is not just the same as failing to promote all the good things that they could have become. It's concentrating on the one, the path they were already on. So I think that even in our more <coughs> reformist, progressive lives, we rely quite heavily, although sometimes only surreptitiously, on the thought that there's something important to preserving the way things are already going, or to keeping faith with the way things are already going, 
even though there would have been better ways for them to go in an entirely tabula rasa world.